Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. So we're going to jump into the final Collector's Edition lore book, which focuses around Keitel, Kallus, and the Cabal in general. This is by far the most fascinating lore book of the three that we get for Lightfall, in my opinion. Not only does it reveal a lot about Kallus and Keitel, but it goes over a lot of stuff to do with Cabal mythology, the Oxa machine, the Midnight Coup, and most notably of all, Cabal biology. Yeah, not sure if anyone expected that. When you start your book with a statement like, I am three years old, my father is pregnant again, you're starting it off with a narrative hook, that's for certain. If you're one of the people who just sat up in their chair and is frantically replaying what I just said, don't sweat it. We'll jump into it all in a bit. Just know that this is objectively not only the most interesting of the Lightfall lore books, but also it is the most immediately relevant to the villains and key characters of Lightfall. At least, I think so. So, without further delay, let's talk about it. Before we start, we should note that the story here is told from Keitel's perspective. These entries are more like diary entries of hers, or official archives of what she's remembered, or at least written, and they're held in great detail. I imagine that this is assisted by some kind of technology given that the Empire is a whole lot more technologically advanced than we are, and the fact that some of these entries are from when she was a child, literally three years old in some cases. But regardless, I think we have to keep in mind that Keitel's perspective is clearly on display. Also, and this is going to sound like a very strange bit, it may be the case that she doesn't need technology for this even if she is three, and the reason I say that is because being three may mean something different to the Cabal than it does to us. Hear me out on this one, okay? It's going to sound a little bit weird. Being three for us means you've been around the rotation of your sun three times, right? The Earth has gone ahead and fulfilled its orbit three times and you're three years old. The Cabal come from a different world, meaning that it may have a different orbital period. The point is, it's entirely possible that their world is larger and further away from the sun, meaning that three years for them may not necessarily be the same as three years for us. Just an interesting little note about how time works relative for different species. That's not the first time we're going to be talking about stuff like that in this video today. Either way, it's Keitel's perspective. And when she's cussing out her father, you can tell that this is a piece of showing its built-in bias. Callus may have earned that bias, but it's worth remembering that this is Keitel's perspective nonetheless. The book's entries do not read chronologically in time, but they are listed out in an order that bears some relevance. So that's the order in which I'll be explaining them. So let's begin at the first entry, which is the one that starts off with the note at the top about I am three, my father is pregnant again. In this entry, it speaks from the early perspective of Keitel and it talks about how in her infancy, Callus was pregnant, but that he was not pregnant with more children from Keitel's mother. I know that whole statement will boggle some people's minds, so I want to let you know, yes, it's absolutely 100% serious, and no, it's actually not that strange. So let's go ahead and straighten a few things out here. Number one, they are aliens. Alien life, and even a lot of life here on planet Earth, doesn't work by the typical structures that we've set up in our own society. It, by definition, evolved on another planet, with different conditions that led it to where they are today. Evolution will inevitably mean that different creatures exposed to different environments with different challenges evolved differently. Not to mention, when you take a look at the way that the Cabal do it, you're looking at something where it's a bit more of a seahorse kind of thing, but more on that later. Number two, translations of different languages are not perfect. It's worth remembering that in Destiny, the various alien species that we fight against or alongside do not necessarily share all of the same linguistic quirks that we do. It is definitely the case in this instance that the word pregnant is simply the closest Cabal translation for a process that might be described differently in the Cabal Ulurant tongue. Stuff like this happens all the time with our own species history, and there are words in some cultures that don't have direct translations. For example, the word Han in Korean is translated into something that means a deep sorrow that's filled with regret, anger, or grief in English. And here's the thing, 
Sorrow, regret, anger, and grief are all emotions that are negative, but in realistic terms, that's very broad as far as descriptors go, and that's a very rough translation. And there's a reason for this. There is no single English word as an equivalent for what Han really is. We just have to go and give broad descriptors for it. It is a very specific emotion and feeling. So we just have to describe what's closest, and that has to be the best we have as a description of Han. This isn't even a strange quirk compared to some other languages. I mean, look at a ton of English words and translate them into French. If it's the case that you see a match between them, you know, there are going to be points at which you just sit there and realize, yeah, we English totally stole that word from the French. So, not too surprising in this instance that the Kabul have used the word pregnant because it's the closest human analogy to something that for them maybe is a little bit different but is entirely biologically correct. Number three, as far as their bodies show us, this evolutionary trait is supported by other parts of Kabul biology. Confused? Let me explain. In many animals like deer, you'll see males growing enormous antlers to compete with each other in the mating season. This is done typically on a constant basis to not only show the strength of their genes to prospective partners, but also to show other males that they are the top dog and shouldn't be messed with. Equally, male lions in Africa will compete with other males to protect their pride, given that if another male does take over, the male will likely slaughter all of the offspring of the original lion. In this entry, it is noted by Keitel's nurse, a scion named Aja, that Cabal mothers are kind of doing both of those behaviours I just listed for male deer and lions. And it's just a case that the parenthood factor of Cabal is a little bit different as far as the division of labour is concerned. Mothers have tusks because they're defending their mates, just like deer are defending against other deer who would be trying to take them. And they also have tusks to defend their mates because of the fact that their male mates gestate their young. Their natural defences, not just against predation, but also against other rival females who might take their mate away. And that's kind of crucial, because apparently the entire process can mean that the male chooses to leave the brood that he is currently in the process of rearing. So, how does this entire process actually work? Let me go ahead and actually break it down bit by bit for you. I know, biology coming in, I bet this is not what you all expected when you clicked on this video, but here it is. And you know what? Relevant, pertinent, and actually kind of interesting if you truly do just sit down and break it on a scientific level. As best Aja explains it, the process works like this. After two cabal have mated, a female cabal is up first. She gestates the young, which in human terms would be just like carrying them to term as a normal baby. But for a cabal, after this gestation is complete, the pregnancy isn't technically complete at all. It's just half done. She passes off the pregnancy and the children in question to the father. The father then broods the offspring of the mother until they are weaned. Seemingly, this works a little bit like how certain marsupials, such as kangaroos, keep their young in protective warm pouches. The big difference between the cabal offspring is in this instance that they eventually are weaned off, meaning that the father is also the one who creates milk for the whole process. This is a moment at which the pregnancy is only considered over when they are removed from the pouches of the father. So it's kind of a half and half process. So, that's a lot, and I'm sorry if that was more cabal biology than you ever thought you needed to know, but hey, look, listen, interesting stuff. And, you know, there are things out there in the world that make you realise that there is no such thing as normal whatsoever, so just keep in mind that whatever your conception of what a normal pregnancy should be is, there is no such thing as a strange pregnancy. They are all just pregnancies in this instance. I mean, you know, if the cabal are kind of doing it how like seahorses do, and the father is taking on the burden for the predominant nature of it all, then that's fine. It's one of those moments of just nature deciding to do things in a certain different way. Happens all the time, apparently, and strange as it may seem to us, the cabal have clearly been evolving to do this, so you know what? Fair enough. It also makes a certain degree of evolutionary sense as to why the female cabal are the ones with tusks yet again, so, you know you have that to work into as far as the actual biology of the creatures is concerned. However, 
That is just the cabal biology that is explained to us in the first entry. The real stuff here, as far as anything to do with the plot is concerned, is all around Keitel. Because Keitel sees all of this, remembers all of it as an explanation from her nurse, the Scion, and most importantly of all, she makes the quick note, quite crucially, that Callus is pregnant again, and that the mother of these new pregnant offspring is actually not her mother, it's another female cabal that he is mating with. This is one of those moments at which Keitel starts asking questions, and in particular one question that will pursue her for the rest of her life. Is my mother dead? And this is one of those moments at which Callus handily dodges the question. Keitel also asks if it's true that a cabal father can forsake his children and turn them out of his brood pouches. To this, Callus responds that it is, and that she did not suffer such a fate because he loves her. So yeah, that first entry from the very beginning sets the stage of something rather remarkable. It shows us a little bit about Callus. it shows us a little bit about the nature of his being, and it shows us a lot about Cabal biology. However, moving on in the next entry, we see a fully grown Keitel. She is centuries old at this point, and after the Midnight Coup has gone down, she is writing this entry. She is now living in a life where assassins are coming to find her at the behest of her father, and these assassins wield a blade. The blade is called Heart Shadow. Some of you may remember it from the various different times that you've run Keitel Farm, but if you didn't farm any of that, just know that it is the reward for completing the final Keitel encounter of the Duality Dungeon. Duality rewards this because, well, it's a very special blade. It's one that is specifically tied to both Callus and Keitel. Heart Shadow in the context Keitel finds it is always sent to her by an assassin from her father. For those that don't remember, this is a Scion Mind Forged Blade that is made from an actine, a quantum memetic material that always remembers its original shape after it was forged. It was passed as an heirloom from each female member of the Imperial Cabal family to the next. It would have been Keitel's mother's until it was no longer hers, at which point it was passed to Callus so that one day he might pass it on to Keitel. Keitel spurns this blade every time and breaks it, leaving the fragments for her father to find, but it will always reform. This is a property of the material it's made from, which again is called an actine. As long as you touch a piece of the blade and remember its original shape, the blade can return to that shape. By this point in time, this means that the only means of communication between Callus and his daughter is this blade, and as a result, their relationship is nothing more than an exchange of bladed assassins failing and shattered remnants remaining. The next entry shows more of Keitel's childhood at the same age of three. In this entry, she is playing outside her father's chambers. He is still pregnant, but his new mate is arguing with him. The guards outside are watching Keitel closely, but they're not stopping her from inadvertently listening in on the conversation. Callus's new mate accuses him in that moment of not having kept political promises to ex-Praetoriate families. The Praetoriate, for those of you who don't know, were the previous rulers of Toro Bartel. This matters simply because of the fact that these were the group that Callus overthrew. The fact that he was making political promises to them in the first place was something that he probably lamented, something that he was probably not very pleased with. After all, when he came to power, he executed every single one of the Praetoriate that was around in the Cabal Senate chamber. Seriously, this was a bloody revolution if nothing else. These matters, however, do not seem to bother Callus. Callus overthrew the Praetoriate in order to ascend to the throne, but now it doesn't seem to really bother him that he's not keeping the prizes to those that switched sides to support him. Even in these early stages of Keitel's life, Callus seems to only care for hedonism. As for his mate, Callus only wants her to be happy with being mated to him, and he wants them to both engage in hedonism, and to regard no such concerns other than their own happiness. 
because to Callus, this is all that matters. She says she is concerned with other matters, such as policy and external security. Callus complains that she doesn't make him happy. She says that there's more to life than happiness. Callus disagrees. This escalates into an argument, and then Callus' mate strikes him. After a short moment of silence that leaves everyone in shock, Callus does something which Keitel doesn't recognize at first, but to us, it would seem rather unthinkable. In that moment, Callus opens his brood pouches and lets go of his new mate's offspring, saying that he doesn't want them anymore. He doesn't shout this, he says it softly, and follows up by saying, if you cannot love me, then how could they? To this, his now former mate storms out in a rage with her now fatherless and underdeveloped children, all carried in her arms. Callus bids her to find a new father for them, perhaps some beau in the barracks, a lover that is within the military, and she tells them to, well, go and fill his pouches with the young instead. Rather distressing, to say the very least. One of those moments at which you sit there and you realize this really was quite the way to ask for a divorce. This entry shows that Callus' need for opulence and his lack of regard for anything else existed long before his daughter was born. He would have been well versed in the political machinations of the Empire by this point in time. He would have known that such a choice would have consequences, practical, political, and even just simply moral. But he did it anyway. The next entry is from Keitel when she is 35, and it's from a night that contains a lot of lore. In this night, she has just returned from her first deployment against the Sindhu, one of the various different species that the Cabal conquered. She is fighting against them at this moment in time, and having returned from her first deployment, Callus threw her a massive celebration for her safe return. It's worth noting that Callus is really not happy that she is on this kind of war footing in the first place, that she is serving in the military alongside Amun Arath, that she is even out there fighting on the front lines. He instead wishes that she would stay home and wishes that she would engage in an opulent life of happiness with him. Torabattle's streets as a result are filled with trampled fruit and fireworks. It's at this point that a really strange conversation between Keitel and her tutor, the Evercut General Umun Arath, takes place. I know this video is long already, but I want to read this next bit in full. Hopefully, you'll see why. Your name is a prayer for war, the Evercut General says. I snap to attention. She laughs at me and offers a small harpoon of canapes and a cocktail with a middling-sized shrub. I decline, and she tusks. You should enjoy yourself. It's your party. Although we both know it is his party. My father named me for a star, I say. Nothing to do with war. Yes, but the star Keitel was named for a myth. Not an old homeworld myth, either. A myth from the Age of Sails, when we conquered the stars. Surely you know it, assuming that you've been briefed on the Oxa? The Odile Zenotaph Anarchive, sometimes Oxta, depending on how you construct the acronym. The alien oracle that led us to the graves of Ark. Must be wary now, Oxa is a Scion myth and the Scions are a sensitive topic. My father wants to free them from bondage. It claimed to record the story of the galaxy, and to prophesize what may yet come. A black box for galactic civilizations, if you prefer it in pilot's terms, the Evocate General nods to the pin on my right pauldron. I am conscious of my shaved down tusks, of the sores left by my fighter's interface. The doomed and the damned left the record of their downfall in the Oxa. Your star got its name from the oldest myths in the archive. And when your mother told your father that story, the star became your name. A prayer that all will go as it must, and the way it must go is struggle. Ayat. Not a word in Ularant or any other cabal tongue, but Keitel means something else. Yes. 
it may not always go as it needs to go. A good name for a soldier. A strange name for a daughter, I say. Your father chose it for your mother's sake. Out of love. I remain at attention. I do not look at her. So she's dead. The Evocate General looks sharply at her cocktail shrub in the edge of my vision. He never told you. No. Well, she sounds genuinely shocked. Then it's not my place. Evocate General? A junior pilot should not address her senior officer so directly, but we are in the palace, and I am the Princess Imperial. What does your name mean? She grins. Her tusks are huge. My parents were soldiers. Soldiers know mythology too. So this was worth reading out in full because we learn stuff here that's pretty wild. Keitel's name is in fact related to the hive word Ayat. The hive word Ayat, which is a prayer for war and a prayer for destruction and a prayer in the knowledge that struggle and suffering is required for progress. It's pretty wild on its own. We also now know that Umunarath's name, in great irony, is in fact something that's clearly taken from the hive mythology of Sivuarath, the hive god of war. It's even more ironic considering that the final act of Amunarath would be to welcome the hive god of war to the Cabal homeworld. Strange indeed. It's at this point though that I actually want to go ahead and direct you to someone else's video. Myelin went ahead and made a video specifically on this entire paragraph that I've just read, and it's all about the information to do with the Oxa and Oxter machines. It seems at this point that the idea of the Oxa machine in itself is pretty well explained. It's an archive of all sorts of dead civilizations, but the oldest myth in that archive being to do with Oryx, Fundament, Savathun, Sivur, Wrath, the Hive, clearly all of that raises a few alarm bells. And the interesting thing, something which Mylin talks about a whole lot more, is that if you rearrange the changed acronym for Oxa, aka Oxta, you can rearrange those four letters into another name, Taox. For those of you that don't know, this is an ancient character from the Books of Sorrows that is absolutely bound up with Oryx, Savathun, Zivu, Arath, all of their stories. It's someone who saw the downfall of the Krill as they turned into the Hive, and was in fact able to flee pretty consistently, and was never caught by Oryx or Zivu or Savathun in all of her time doing this. So it seems as though there is some kind of tangible link between the Oxa and Teox. Now let's keep in mind, lots of the writing here is written with the sense of possibility. It's not clear what the relationship may or may not have been, and it's also entirely possible that the lore does these little about takes and simply leaves little bits and pieces there as fascination meant to be a red herring. So it's not totally impossible that that's the case here, but it is really tantalizing to believe it. And you know what? I think it's worth watching Mylin's video on the topic. So yeah, link somewhere up top in the right hand corner so that you guys can get a little bit more of a filling in on that particular one. It's totally fascinating and it's absolutely worth listening to. Anyway, moving on. We also learn that Keitel still doesn't know the fate of her mother, but that the circumstances must have been something strange as far as she is concerned. In the next entry, we see Keitel and Callus watching one of the first gladiatorial battles that Gaul ever took part in. Callus tells Keitel a story that explains both the Leviathan and those who were previously Imperial rulers before him. He explained that the previous Imperial Empress had grown so old that she had begun the Cabal process of ossifying. In other words, she was literally turning into nothing more than just bones because she was so old. Her ossified corpse was shepherded around the Empire in a ship modelled after a Cabal land whale. This was done so that the Praetoriate had more time to avoid the chaotic process that a succession would have created, at least according to Callus, It's clear that the ship in question is the Leviathan. 
Appropriate then that it would one day become the ship of Callus's exile. This is all even more appropriate because the duel being witnessed in the arena before them includes such whales, as far as I can tell, and the purpose of those whales is combat. Needless to say, as he always did, Gaul would end up winning this engagement moments after this story is told by toppling the champion whale pilot off of his mount. The next entry is from Keitel when she turned 38. It was her first major engagement with the enemy as a pilot, three years after her successful return for the first time after she had been fighting the clips and had seen no action. In this first true action, she was able to successfully take on nine enemy ships and live to tell the tale. When she rose nearly dead in the crew deck of the Cabal ship where she was returned to, she went and she screamed that she got all nine of them. And as her crewmates cheered, she knew in that moment that she was loved, not as a princess, but as the ship's latest ace pilot. This, if nothing else, cements exactly what kind of ruler Keitel is going to be. She lives by the philosophy of leading from the front. She will engage in battle on the front lines. She will not hold back and be a coward from the rear. The next entry returns to the earlier night where Keitel heard more about her name. This is three years prior. Both her and Amunarath sit and witness something awful in the form of Callus being very drunk. Callus enters the room literally making the noises and imitating the instrumental playing of a track of music around the Cabal from Destiny 1 which is called Cabal Stomp. You will know it, I'm sure. You know, you, you get the point. He's trying to have a good time. All of this is happening as he is exceptionally drunk and he's clutching a two meter long model of the Almighty. At this point, Molly and Molly, the master of celebrations and ceremonies, states that Umunarath had made a request of the Emperor, namely that he should honor the soldiers of the Empire that were far away from home. This comment sends Callus into a totally wild tirade. He does not want to honor those soldiers. He gets mad at Umunarath, at Keitel, and against everyone else. It's when Keitel, however, sits there and mentions that she continues to serve the military because she has a duty to the Cabal people that Callus really loses it. He says that the legions and the armies of the Cabal only exist for his pleasure and opulence and to secure them. He shouts that feeling good is the only reason to exist. He rails against the whole of the Cabal and throws the model of the Almighty. This is all in the middle of the party, at which point the music turns silent, the guests turn silent in shock, and he is doing nothing but shouting full tilt at his general and his daughter. When he is finally done, he turns to Keitel alone, and instead of shouting, he simply talks, saying, I would have had a thousand more young, if only I could have made you happy. So that leaves some heaviness in the conversation. It clearly weighed on Keitel because the next entry of hers is a psychic meta-concert with the other conspirators of the Midnight Coup centuries later. This is the coup that was conducted by various coup plotters in order to overthrow Callus. It was headed up not merely by Gaul, but also by the former consul of the Praetoriate, and also by Keitel and various other members of Emperor Callus's core staff. This included his favorite tea merchant, his Evercut general Amuna Rath. It included his master of ceremonies, his personal bodyguard, and even a scion who had control of a reconstructed Oxa machine. It's this Oxa machine that is providing everyone with the psychic meta-concert so that they can all secretly communicate with each other. In this instance, Keitel unintentionally receives a memory from Gaul of her father, a memory that actually casts him in a very sympathetic light and actually almost undoes the entire Midnight Coup. In this vision, this memory that Gaul unintentionally sends to Keitel, she sees her father, stating that essentially Keitel is the last true star in his life, and the conversation really heavily implies that her mother is dead. 
there is talk of well-wishers and talk about how Keitel is the last thing worth living for, and it's all very heavy in tone. It's something that drives a great deal of sympathy into Keitel, and a few days later, she even meets with her father having seen that memory, and she has a mind to confess everything about the Midnight Coup. But she asks questions first. A simple question. What did you want when you took the throne? To this, Callus at first answers that he wanted to take the throne to make a better world for her. Probing further, Keitel notes that she hadn't been born yet, and that he must have wanted something before then. To this, Callus responds by pulling out a shard of Ahamkara bone from nearby, near to where the Imperial throne lies, and he states that in his hands, it did nothing. This is actually an important detail, because Ahamkara feed off of desires. Ahamkara bones are capable of doing so too. They have the ability to grant wishes granted via wish magic. And the ridiculous thing about this is that Callus wants for nothing. Callus wants for nothing. Therefore, the wish dragon bone doesn't work. And that's a huge red flag, because remember, this is some point at which Keitel believes that her mother has been lost. And so the prying obvious question that Keitel asks is, are you sure you didn't even just want to bring mother back? Callus at this point reveals that he pushed away Keitel's mother, and he could not wish for her back because he did not want her back. It was not some tragic death, it was simply him choosing to move on and find a new mate and he couldn't bring her back because he did not want her back. He did not truly love her. This is one of those moments at which revelations come flooding towards Keitel. She makes the painful assertion, connects the dots herself, and then in the next paragraph she is literally cussing him out in her mind. This moment reveals to her the depravity of her father, truly. He has never loved anyone other than himself. He doesn't care for anyone else, only himself. There is no true misery in his life other than when he believes he has been wronged. Only the opulence and greed that surrounds him in this moment is what will fill his days if he has his way. That greed, according to Keitel, will be his downfall. And it's at this moment that she finds all of the power and resolve that she needs to enact the Midnight Coup. It's worth noting that her part in the Midnight Coup was one of the most pivotal. Whilst yes, there were certain factors that allowed information to be passed, there were those that removed Callus from power and those that prevented his guard from making any particular moves in contrary to them, there was Keitel, with her part to play in the Imperial Throne Room. Callus wanted to remain on the throne, and there was one artifact that would let him do it, but Keitel was there, and she was able to take that one artifact, the Ahamkara bones and crush them to dust right in front of Callus so that he couldn't use their power. Keitel made a clear and determined choice there that she would lead her people to greatness without her father, that she would be better, and that she did not need him. This is the true development of the story between Callus and Keitel. Now you truly understand what Callus is like. Whilst undoubtedly he has a soft spot for his daughter, it is realistically the case that if he could simply buy her admiration, he would have done so ten times over, even if it had cost him more gold than existed in all of the Cabal Empire. And why? Because he simply wants things for himself. He only wants to feel happiness and opulence. That is it. Nothing more is required for Callus. He does not care for the rest of the world. If he was able to watch it burn until all of eternity faded out, and if the burning was entertaining, he would sit happily and sip his wine until the end of time. That is not a fate that Keitel wishes to see the world endure, and that is why she is fighting with us. And so here and now, that is all from this particular video. And that is all of the content from the Destiny to Lightfall Collector's Edition lore books. I hope you enjoyed it all, and if you did, 
go ahead and leave a like. Let me know what you're thinking about Lightfall down below in the comments section as well. And if you want more Destiny Lightfall content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership as always is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Orodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.